Good evening, this is Dr. Lou Foley, one of the exam pro faculty, and I wanna welcome you to our postponed exam pro webinar. I will apologize, like most of you, well, I assume all of you, I'm in active clinical practice and I had a clinical issue that came up last night that delayed me from being able to do the webinar. So I'm glad to be here with you tonight. I apologize for anybody who came last night and waited and uh, did not know what was going on. Uh, hopefully we'll make up for it tonight with a really good webinar. This is July, so all of you are done collecting cases, and I assume that all of you are working on your case list preparation. We're gonna talk for a few minutes about case list preparation, maybe for the first half or so of the webinar, and then we'll go through a couple of sample structured cases. And as we get to the end, I'll make time and answer questions as well. So the first thing I wanna know, um, I'm just gonna single out Dr. Hill, if you can hear me. Can you raise a hand on the, uh, Go to webinar software if you can hear me. I'm just confirming that the audio is working. Okay, great, you can take your hand down. Perfect, thank you. All right, so it seems like all our technology is working. Let's go ahead and get into it. First thing, uh, this is a, an older appearing version of the GoToWebinar software. I assume that all of you are familiar with it, uh, at least enough to get into the webinar tonight. Let me go through a few key points as we go uh, through the webinar tonight. The little orange box with a white arrow, uh, which looks slightly different, but same colors, allows you to collapse or expand the control panel so you can get it out of your view during the webinar. The upper portion of the control panel determines, or the audio portion determines how you will participate. By default, usually the software for GoToWebinar will pick your computer as your source for audio. If you're in an area with a lot of background noise, or if you prefer to use your telephone, you can do that by just clicking use telephone. Uh, and then you'll be given a dial-in number, an access code, and importantly, an audio PIN number. If you don't enter the audio PIN at the end, then I will not be able to unmute you so that you can participate. So that's an important step. We're not gonna use the type in box for questions. Instead, we'll use the raise a hand feature and then I'll call on you. But I'm gonna try to get through um, the webinar and then answer questions at the end so that we'll try to get as much uh, done tonight as we can. All right, so the last thing I'll say, all of our webinars at ExamPro are recorded, uh, so there is access to recorded webinars if you need that. And if you have any questions about that, you can contact our staff at ExamPro. Let me go ahead and get going. We're gonna be talking, of course, about the 2022 ABOG oral exam. So uh, I've said to a lot of candidates uh, that I've talked to over the past few months that I really believe that this exam will be back to usual in person in Dallas, the oral format like we're all used to. Um, the the um, ACOG meeting in May in San Diego, if any of you were there, it was kind of the beginning of getting back to somewhat normal after the pandemic. And really the, the message was we're gonna do things in person. So I really think the ABOG exam this year will go on as scheduled. I don't think you guys are gonna get called off to do a virtual exam or a written exam like the last two years candidates uh, did. And I also want to make note that the biggest change I think you're going to see this year is the moving up of the dates so that exams are happening October, November, and December rather than November, December, and January. And you guys already know the month of your exams. That was released uh, maybe almost two weeks ago now, the end of June. Uh, and the earlier exam dates translates to less time for you to prepare uh, and so I'm hoping that people will really get going on their preparation instead of taking a break between caseless submission and exam prep. Um, I'm gonna mention a few things here to start out. These are the deadlines. Uh, obviously we finished caseless collection June 30th. August 2nd is the deadline to submit your caseless. There is a late submission deadline. I don't recommend it unless you have an extenuating circumstance that is unavoidable. It's just spending more money and not getting any benefit for it. So try to get your stuff together and submit it by the second. The ABUG Bulletin for 2022, which is on the ABUG website, is the source of directions or instructions on how to prepare your case list and also how the exam is conducted. Uh, it's 43 pages long. Uh, it has a lot of important details and instructions. And of course, the exam dates are October, November, and December. So I'm gonna take a few minutes and I wanna talk about caseless preparation. I know Dr. Shamroth feels very strongly that the case list uh, has a big impact on how you do in the exam and I agree with him completely. 
uh, you know, the exam is really three separate exams. Each of them is an hour in length. Half of each hour is based on your case list. So essentially half of your exam is based on your case list. Now, when I say based on your case list, I don't mean that every question you get will be directly related to a case you managed. But what I mean is that they're gonna try to start the discussion using the information that you've presented to them on your list. The better the information is, and when I say better, I mean, is it organized? Is it uh, easy for them to follow and understand what your management was? Um, do you have some interesting diagnoses and some potentially interesting complications? And have you presented it to them in a way that psychologically invites them to ask predictable questions? If you do this and you do it well, then the the case list part of your exam will be a lot of fun. Uh, you're not going to feel that way while you're sitting there, but when you get home, you'll look back and say, I'm glad that I spent some time preparing my case list because instead of feeling lost, I felt like you know I was more involved in the exam than I realized I could be. And well, you can't completely control the exam, but you have a lot more control than you realize, and the case list is the starting point for that. Remember that your examiner has to review six case lists the night before they give you your exam. They're going to review your case list plus the other five people that they're examining that day. So if your case list is an ex a very nice example of a well-organized, professionally done, uh, thoughtfully presented case list, then you're going to start out right off the bat with a good first impression before they've even met you. And uh, the, the results on the exam are, are, high, are highly influenced by the case list. So I think I've made that point. Um, you cannot, uh, you're not wasting your time if you're working on your case list, if you're trying to, to really tune it up, uh, it's going to be valuable time. All right, so how does the case list work in the exam? Candidates are not allowed to bring a copy into the exam, and they actually state this clearly in the bulletin. The examiners are going to select cases from the case list that you submitted through the ACOG, I'm sorry, ABOG software. Um, they're going to put up individual cases is usually how this is going to work. So they'll put it on the computer screen and then they'll they'll ask you what they want to ask you about the case. Um, because you don't have your case list in front of you and because you're not seeing the case that came before or the case that came after, it's a little more difficult to identify exactly which patient they've picked if you don't have a good grasp of the material and the cases that are on your list, okay? Uh, it's also a little more difficult to reference practice patterns that are demonstrated in other cases. What I mean by this is when you had a paper case list in your hands and they ask you about your large number of repeat cesarean sections, it's pretty easy to say, well, you know, if you go to page number 20 and you've got it in front of you, you flip to it, you'll see that I've got 10 VBACs. So you can't really do that kind of stuff when they're presenting individual cases on the computer. You, if you know your case list well, you can mention, yes, you know, I, I would also point out, and, and it's not, oh, you're not always going to be in a situation where you want to do this, um, where you want to kind of direct the examiner to look at something that, that on your case list that you think is important. You don't, you want to be careful not to seem like you're um, being difficult. Okay, but there are opportunities where you can reference practice patterns that are demonstrated by other cases on your case list. It's a little harder to do though with this format. So you really need to know your material well. Uh, and so this is why it's, it's also important that your cases are easy to read and, and follow because you're gonna be looking at the cases on the computer as well. And if you have laid it out nicely, you'll be able to quickly remember, oh yeah, I know this case and you'll be ready to talk about it. Okay, so let's go through a couple of things. First of all, uh, consider the fact that abbreviations are commonly used in medical care uh, to make communication a little bit less tedious, less writing. ABOG has an approved list of abbreviations on pages 41 to 43 of the 2022 bulletin. Um, and I'm gonna show you an example of an older version of the abbreviations list, just so you'll know what I'm talking about when you go to look for it uh, on the next slide in just a second. I encourage you to use the ABOG approved abbreviations every chance you can. And so the, the abbreviation list looks like this. this. This is back in the day when the bulletin was much shorter. It's usually one of the last pages in the bulletin. And this was page 22. And of course, this year's bulletin has 43 pages. So it's longer than this, the one from this year. Um, this, this, this was in years past and this was a much shorter abbreviation list. It was only one page. Now the current abbreviation list is about three pages. All right, so 
Let's talk about abbreviations that are ABOG approved that are often overlooked in preparing a case list. For a vaginal delivery that was not a forceps or a cesarean, this would be an SVD. For a cesarean delivery, the abbreviation they prefer is CD. For a vaginal hysterectomy, TVH. Preterm labor, PTL. The ultrasound, US, so pelvic US. BTL for bilateral tubal ligation. AB for abortion, so a missed AB or an incomplete AB. And DNC for dilation and curatage. These are just a few very common terms that appear on almost everybody's case list. I don't know why that did that. Hold on one second. A few very common terms uh, that there are approved abbreviations for. I encourage you to use these every chance you can. And I also encourage you to be consistent. So, you know, call every delivery an SVD, not just a few here and there. Be consistent with your terms and your abbreviations. What about other abbreviations that are not on the ABOG approved list? I would, I would tell you to use caution and good judgment. Non-standard abbreviations can be confusing. So for instance, if you have CX on your case list, you know, cervix, cancel, what does this mean? Um, I just, this is just an example of something I saw on a case list once that struck me as a very strange non-standard abbreviation. Related abbreviations are often okay. What I mean here is that ABOG's approved list includes HRT, and I would feel very comfortable to use ERT in a patient who didn't have her uterus if you so chose. The more consistent and common the abbreviation, the more likely it will work. So believe it or not, DNA is not an approved abbreviation, IUPC is not an approved abbreviation, and BPP is not an approved abbreviation, but I've seen them on case lists for many, many years, uh, and uh, you know I do not think it's a problem if you use an established abbreviation like that. So again, Use your good judgment. If it's something that universally every OBGYN would recognize right away, you can probably get away with it. If it's something that's more local, something that you learned in training but you haven't seen since, you might want to avoid it. Um, I do also recommend against trying to shorten the entry on your list by using things like S slash P for status post or H slash O for history of. These things are kind of informal. They make the list, um, sometimes they can make the list look a little bit uh, a little bit less professional, if you will. So I generally stay away from stuff like that. All right, let's talk about um, terminology. When I look at case lists, I often will see the same exact diagnosis or the same exact pathology specimen described with different terms or different abbreviations. Now, when we talk about variety, because it's good to have variety on your case list, ABOG wants us to demonstrate that we manage a variety of different OBGYN problems. We're talking about different patients with unique diagnoses, with comorbidities that are, you know, different management strategies that differ, and outcomes that are different. We're not talking about using different terms to describe the same issue or the same outcome or the same pathology. When the examiners come across a list where you've used all kinds of different terms and, and they can quickly figure out that you're just trying to describe the same thing with different terms, it just looks sloppy, like you, you weren't um, you know, being careful and kind of cleaning your list as you went, trying to, to make it professional. So the, try if you, I'm gonna show you in a second some example slides of different ways people enter certain things and you can use any of these different ways. Just pick the one you're going to use and use it consistently. So let's look at this, and I think you'll understand. If you have a patient with diabetes in pregnancy, most people will list it as GDMA1 or GDMA2 as a, usually an antepartum complication on the OB list. And that's great. I think that's the preferred approach. But if you just said gestational diabetes, or you said gestational diabetes on medication, or you said diabetes in pregnancy, these are all acceptable. There's no uh, prohibition on using these terms. Now, GDM is an ABOG approved abbreviation, so I encourage people to use it. But what's most important is that whatever term you choose, you should consistently use it throughout your case list, rather than having one that says GDM A1, one that says gestational diabetes, and another case that says diabetes in pregnancy. We're talking about the same thing, use the same terminology. With thyroid hormone deficiency, hypothyroidism is what most of us would call this, but you could say maternal thyroid disease, elevated TSH, abnormal thyroid function. Any of these could um, be a, a descriptor to describe thyroid hormone deficiency. And I think you guys can see the, the, the where I'm going with this. Pick the one that, that you're going to use that you're comfortable with. 
and use it throughout your list. Just a couple other examples. Ultrasound of the pelvis. I mentioned that US is an ABOG approved abbreviation. So I prefer US or pelvic US, or I think even TV US is acceptable, although TV US is not the approved ABOG abbreviation, but TV US transvaginal ultrasound, I think we all see that all the time. Um, so it's really gonna be acceptable for any of these if you choose them. The other thing I will say about ultrasound in particular is the actual result often contains too little or too much information. So, you know, what you want to give the examiners are the information that was used in managing the patient, okay? And any imaging study you get, you could copy verbatim what the radiologist dictates, but really you don't have room for that. And most of it is, is redundant or uh, extra words that are narrative in, in uh, purpose. You don't need that. You just need the key points, the pertinent positives, or in the case of imaging, sometimes something that wasn't present, a normal result can be useful in deciding on a management strategy. So again, you wanna to try to get, convey the key points from the imaging study. You wanna be careful not to leave things out that are important and not to put in so much information as to make it difficult for the examiner to quickly see what the point was. Uh, with endometrial sampling, EMB is very common. It's not an approved abbreviation. Uh, but it's commonly used in endometrial biopsy and endometrial BX, which would be my least favorite of the three, um, are also things I see on the case list. Now, a couple other examples of standardizing your terminology. If you have a patient with obesity in pregnancy, you know, most people will mention obesity as an antepartum complication. There are a whole bunch of things that we do for patients who have obesity as a complication of their pregnancy. And so I generally think it's advantageous to have some entry in the treatment column that refers to your overall strategy for obesity. And there's lots of different ways you can enter this, and I've listed some of them here. Uh, and the key is that if you're gonna do it on one case, then do it on the other cases and use the same terms. Uh, antenatal surveillance, uh, which it can either be increased visit frequency, serial ultrasounds, fetal testing, uh, antenatal surveillance can be described in a variety of different ways. And again, in general, you would be doing, if you're doing the same type of surveillance, then you would refer to it with the same terms. Now, I do want to point something out. Occasionally, you'll have a case where you will use different terminology to describe something specifically to draw attention to something about that case that was slightly different than the usual. And so there can be some very subtle situations in which you will you will describe something slightly differently um, because there was something unique about that case. I don't have an example to show you right now, but as we go through, we, uh, if I think of one, I'll point one out. The bottom line is consistency, standardization is preferred unless you're trying to draw the examiner's attention to something, um, hoping that they will uh, ask you a particular question or about a particular issue. Okay. Um, a couple more, induction of labor, a lot of different ways that people list that. I, I usually prefer just to say induction of labor. IOL is not an approved abbreviation. A lot of people use it. Uh, I think it's, oh, it's common enough that the examiners know what it is, but I still would, if it was me, I'd write it out. Um, now, we're going to talk, I think, in just a second about the psychology behind the way you describe certain things. And I think that um, with permanent sterilization, um, this, is, this is one of those things that can sometimes, the way it's presented uh, can, well, it's, it's probably not, there's, there's another example I'm gonna give you in a minute. So let me just keep going, because I don't wanna take too much time on that. There's a variety of different ways you can describe it. I think all of these are acceptable. All right, uh, I'm gonna show you an example of the psychology of um, terminology when we talk about repeat C-section and, uh, trial of labor. So we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. Uh, in fact, it's on this slide. Perfect. So these are some examples of the psychology that the terminology you use can generate in the examiner's mind. If you have patients getting repeat cesarean sections and it's very common and every case says request, repeat, request, repeat, request, repeat. The psychology behind that is that you really don't encourage patients to consider a trial of labor. You just kind of, they just come in, they want to repeat, so you do it, which is not necessarily true. 
but again, in the in the mind, the way things come across sometimes is not the way that we meant them to. On the other hand, if every case where the patient was a candidate for a trial of labor and they did not have a trial of labor, references declines trial of labor, or, and this would usually be in the antepartum column, or in the treatment column, it might say TOLAC counseling, okay? And of course, they didn't have a TOLAC, so obviously they declined it. But every time that you have one of these cases and you, you consistently mention trial of labor, you psychologically set the examiner up to be thinking about your emphasis on the conservative practice of OBGYN encouraging appropriate candidates to consider a trial of labor. Uh, when we talk about induction of labor, if you have a case that was purely an elective induction, there's really no reason you have to say elective. You can just say induction of labor. They can look at the case, and if they don't see any indication, they'll know that the, the induction was a choice rather than a medical requirement. And if they want to ask you about it, they will. Now, I will point something out here. This was a much more important point, elective induction, I think back four or five years ago. As the ARRIVE trial has kind of been digested and adopted, I don't think there's as much focus on if patients are 39 and zero and beyond, there's not as much focus on uh, induction of labor being a problem, but there has been more emphasis on how you define failed, uh, failed induction or arrest of either dilation or descent. So uh, what I mean by this is if you do a lot of elective inductions, you just need to be prepared that you have a good grasp of what would be an appropriate definition of failed induction and arrest of descent or dilation so that the examiner uh, knows that when you do an induction that you're committed. And, you know, of course, it's never a good thing to do a cesarean section because you've got somewhere to go. And I don't think any of you guys are doing that. So the key point here is that the elective induction, I don't think you have to call it elective. You can just say induction of labor and the case will really speak for itself. And what's most important is how the case ends up and that you're using appropriate criteria. All right, when we think about a missed AB, one way that you can, um, again, emphasize your sort of a conservative obstetric practice or gynecologic practice, however you want to consider it, instead of saying request surgical management uh, in the pre-op column, you can, you can say something like counseled on treatment options. Now, if the, says, if the case list says counseled on treatment options and the patient had a DNC, then the first question you're probably going to get is, what treatment options did you counsel her about? Which is great because if you take uh, ACOG's practice bulletin on early pregnancy loss, for example, you'll see that there's three treatment options that they talk about that we all talk about with our patients, expectant management, medical management, and surgical management. So again, you can sort of predict that they might ask this question, and you also look a little bit more conservative because the mindset is, oh, they, they talk about the treatment options. It's not just every patient getting surgery. And, and you know, the thing is, I, when you say request surgical management, I don't think anybody ever puts this down because they're pushing patients to have DNCs. I think they put it down because they think, honestly, the patient was counseled and requested surgery. And so it's a, just a little psychological issue related to the terms that are used. All right. Uh, the other th things that I'm going to mention to you, I think, are also important beyond standardization and the psychology of terminology. I want you to remember that this is an oral exam. So don't be tempted to narrate on your case list. So this is an easy example. In the treatment column, it's good to mention counseling, like smoking cessation counseling. That is a nice, succinct description of something you did for a patient to try to get them to quit smoking. You don't want to say something like, I counsel the patient to quit smoking, including the risks such as lung cancer, chronic lung disease, preterm labor, heart disease, da 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 da. You might think that I'm joking about this, but before ABOG had their software program, which limits the amount of characters in most of the, the columns that you can enter, um, some people would write case presentations in their case list. I have seen case lists that had one case per page. That's how, how much verbiage was on there. I'm just going to show you a few small examples. This is not the one page. Let me go back. Uh, hold on. Okay, so uh, this is a very small example. The column I'm going to draw your attention to is this one right here. Under case number seven, I guess it's, no, it's not even the case number because it's cut off, but the, in the second column here, 
two weeks after cesarean section with fascial disruption, which is misspelled, and impressive hematoma of the wound. I mean, this is a little dramatic and it's narrative, it's not necessary. Uh, and so let me show you the next one. If you look across the readmission at the bottom of this entry, the readmission is a book report. It's basically just full sentences describing the whole deal. This is not necessary. So you, uh, you wanna try to distill your case list down into bullet points. And you can see that the original entry is much more of a factual type of entry uh, as you look across and it's much easier to scan through and see what was done. With this, with readmission, you pretty much have to read the whole paragraph to figure out what the candidate's trying to say. So don't narrate, just the facts. You want to present the most important pieces of information um, that you need to get across to the examiner and you wanna leave off the narration and unnecessary words. All right, a couple of other things, surgical pathology. I'm sure you guys are aware of this. The surgical pathology column is for exactly that, surgical pathology. If you do not remove any tissue, if you have a case like a diagnostic laparoscopy and you remove no tissue, then you can, and if you're gonna put anything in the surgical pathology, pathology column, you should state the final clinical diagnosis. So if the patient's pre-op was chronic pelvic pain and you did a diagnostic laparoscopy and you saw endometriosis, but it was over the ureter and you didn't feel comfortable biopsying it, then you can just, in the pathology column, state endometriosis, okay, or peritoneal endometriosis. Now, I wanna point out, if the patient's preoperative and postoperative diagnoses are identical, then there is no uh, reason that you have to restate the diagnosis. So if the patient had a certain diagnosis of endometriosis preoperatively, and then you, in your diagnostic laparoscopy, uh, saw something that you didn't remove, you could just in the surgical pathology put the word none because you, you whatever it was, you didn't, you didn't biopsy it. Um, so when they are the same, then you don't have to restate it, okay? Um, any tissue that you remove should have a result listed in the pathology column. This point gets to, when people do hysterectomy, they usually take out the fallopian tubes. So if the treatment column says a TLH with a bilateral salpingectomy, then the pathology column should have pathology for the uterus as well as pathology for the fallopian tubes. All right, so these examples um, talk about basically uh, just similar to what I just said with endometri endometriosis uh, for chronic pelvic pain. You would put endometriosis in the pathology column if you did not take a biopsy. And when you do a hysterectomy of the BSO, don't forget to talk about the adnexa. All right. One other thing about pathology reports, similar to imaging studies, do not copy the pathology report verbatim into the surgical pathology column. Uh, usually you won't have enough space to do that anyway. Just summarize in a concise fashion with what the intent of the pathology report was. Now there's another thing that I call qualifiers. So be careful how you use certain type of statements. For example, the word protocols. Evaluation per protocol. This is not a good choice in the exam. It, it sort of comes across like you're kind of dodging the point, not trying to really um, provide information about what you did, which many times we're general and we'll say something like diabetes management, okay? And we're gonna be asked, what is diabetes management? What do you mean by that? But don't say something like evaluation per protocol. It's just, it's just too, too nonspecific and, and doesn't sound good. Now there are specific protocols that are widely used in clinical practice that the examiners will know what they are and you obviously wouldn't have room to list them on your case list anyway. So if you say something like ROGAM per protocol, I don't think you even have to say per protocol. If you just say ROGAM in a treatment column, everybody knows kind of how that works. And then if they wanna know, they'll ask you, uh, you know, about your administration of ROGAM. Massive transfusion protocol is an example this you know, used on the case list commonly and appropriately so. Okay, another example. Uh, when you have cross coverage or when you have co-management of patients. So let's say you have a case where uh, something was done that you think could have been done better. And your, your answer to this is on the case list, you put counsel for X by my partner, um, which is kind of like saying, you know, that uh, it's not my fault, they did it. Instead, you can say something like co-manage with my partner. And then they can say to you, well, tell me, what do you mean by co-manage? And you could say, oh, well, I got involved with this case 
when the patient I took I came on call and the patient was four centimeters dilated and I checked her cervix and she was breech. So, you know, the read between the lines is my partner, you know, admitted her and induced her or whatever the case may be and she did and, and the, the patient was breached, the baby was breached, rather than saying that my partner did it, and that's not really an example of counseling, so it doesn't fit really exactly what's on this slide here. But the bottom line is it's always nicer to say something like co-managed, and then when you're talking about it, well, I became involved in this case at point X, Y, or Z. Rather than criticizing what was done, you can say something like, well, if I had been, if they say, well, you know, was this your plan? Well, if I was admitting to this patient from the beginning, I would have preferred to do X, Y, or Z, okay? Uh, so these are things that you have to practice a little bit too, the, the presentation part of it. If you have a sticky case on your list that you're really worried about, and truthfully, you didn't make the critical decision that created the situation that you're concerned about. These are cases where you have to creatively um, enter your information on the case list so that it doesn't appear to like you're pointing fingers or blaming people, but at the same time, you know, there are issues, and then you have to practice how you want to present them verbally. Okay, there are a lot of candidates that put unnecessary information on their case list. And you might say, well, so what? Well, the thing is, when the case list is full of unnecessary information, the examiners have to work twice as hard to figure out what matters and what doesn't, and they have limited time, and that's frustrating. So I'll show you an example in this next slide of a, a couple of things. Restating the diagnosis. So if you have a diagnosis that's listed in the, uh, for instance, antepartum complications column, you don't need to, when you mention the treatment in the treatment column, say for such and such, because you already stated the diagnosis in the antepartum column. Um, and then listing tests or evaluations that were normal and did not impact the case. I generally recommend to people, list the pertinent positive results. Um, you don't need to list a million normal results because it's just a bunch of word salad that the examiner has to sort through to get to what really matters. So this is just an example. I'll show you a few things here. You look at this case number 22, this little red arrow, short cervix is a diagnosis in the antepartum column, increased antepartum surveillance for short cervix. You don't need to say for short cervix. Uh, here we have gestational diabetes class A1. So you don't really need to say class A1. You can just say GDM A1, or you could say gestational diabetes. Uh, if you don't mention medication, it would obviously be A1. So again, you can shorten this up. You can make this a little bit easier to read. Now, a couple of other things, intervaginal progesterone. So this is somebody who did not review the spelling uh, on their case list. Sometimes autocorrect and computers can mess us up, but always get somebody else to put a set of eyes on your list. Even if it's not a professional case list review, have somebody with some medical knowledge, just glance through your list, if they will, looking for anything that seems inconsistent or any obvious misspellings or data entry errors. Now, in this case, Pregnancy-induced hypertension is listed in the antepartum column, and workup for preeclampsia is listed in, the, in the, the treatment column. So here we're kind of mixing and matching terms, um, and it would be better if we use the more current, uh, you know, like preeclampsia, I think would be a better choice. Intrapartum chorioamnionitis, you probably don't need to say intrapartum, uh, and you don't need to repeat over here, you don't need to say treatment of intrapartum chorioamnionitis. You could simply say chorioamnionitis, which by the way, I usually think of that as a delivery complication because it usually occurs during the admission for delivery, but that's another topic altogether. It doesn't have, you can you can do it either way as long as you're consistent about which column you put it in. Um, but when you say treatment intrapartum chorioamnionitis, all you really need to say is antibiotics. And then of course you might be asked, what antibiotics did you give? Or uh, how do you administer, what is your sort of uh, approach to antibiotic treatment of chorioamnionitis, which could get into both the agent, the dose, and the timing. All right, let's go on. So this is an example of a case that has too little information, in my opinion. The amount of information on the case list should really correlate with the complexity of the case. Here we have a one-liner. I mean, there's only, what, seven words, including the abbreviation CD here, for a 37-week gestation that ended in an IUFD with a placental abruption, there is probably a little bit more information that could be listed on the case list here. And it would be important to do that because you would like the examiner to ask you about some of the information that you presented rather than to just 
search up in their mind something they want to talk about related to placental abruption that might not be what you were thinking about for this case. So again, I mean, the bottom line is this is probably not enough information given the significance of the case. All right, uh, when we talk about which cases you list on the case list, you only have to list cases that you managed, and there are a few examples that are important to remember. Midwife patients are not listed on your list unless you delivered the patient for the midwife or you were involved in treating a complication postpartum, like a postpartum hemorrhage or a shoulder dystocia or something like that. You were called in to, to provide treatment to the patient. Of course, they will be on your list. But if you supervise midwives in your practice and they deliver uncomplicated or even complicated patients, but you're not involved in the delivery or the postpartum care, only the supervising physician on paper, if that is the case, um, you do not list those patients. It is the exact opposite for residents. If you supervise residents, every resident delivery goes on your case list if it meets the criteria for a complicated patient. So I'll talk about that in just a second with this next part of the slide. So again, resident patients, they all go on your list whether you did the delivery or whether they did the delivery. Now, there are some obstetrical patients that do not get listed individually. And these are the criteria that ABOG uses to determine which patient doesn't have to be listed. You can see by looking at these that these are very uncomplicated patients. If you induce the patient, they would not qualify here. If the baby is small or big, then that would throw them out, even if everything went smoothly. If the blood loss is more than 500 cc's, uh, 500 mLs, if the patient is 38 weeks and six days or 41 weeks and one day, they fall outside this window. I guess actually 41 and six you could go to because they don't specify in the instructions whether it's 41 weeks completed or 41 weeks at the beginning. So um, bottom line is though that these are very uncomplicated patients. They do not need to be listed. Any patient though between 37 and 39 weeks who's completely uncomplicated does have to be listed in the early term category. All right, a couple other quick things. We're almost wrapped up with this part of the, of the webinar. The office list is limited to 40 patients. Now, last year, uh, because of the pandemic, they had cut it down to 30, but this year they're back to 40. You have to have 40, no more, no less. Of course, you can only have two patients in any given category. So you have to use at least, uh, if you put two in every category, you'd have to use 20 categories, okay? Um, so 40 patients, no more, no less. The office list is also what I would call exclusive, which means you can't have patients on your office list if they're also on your OB list because you delivered them or if they're on your GYN list because you admitted them or did a procedure in the inpatient or surgery center setting. You can have procedures on your office list, but they have to be procedures that are done in the office. And this can sometimes be a little tricky for people who have hospital-based practices who are doing procedures in a, what would be their office, but it's part of the hospital. I think here, if you have that situation, just be true to you know, what is truly an office procedure. I think you're, you really need to put your, uh, most of your significant procedures, if they're like surgery center type stuff, should be on the GYN list. Uh, people that have, don't have hospital-based practices are gonna have all those surgery center stuff easily segregated because uh, they don't, you know, they, they don't have that issue. So, all right. Um, those are, the, I think, the last slide in this section. Then we're going to do some structured cases. Uh, and in this slide, uh, we talk about leading the examiner. Uh, so it's really a great technique if it's done with care. So, for instance, if you have a patient who had factor V Leiden mutation, you could enter in the problem list contraindication to hormonal, con hormonal contraception. Uh, when the examiner sees contraindication to hormonal contraception, they're going to look at the whole case, but they're going to be wondering, well, what was the contraindication? And then if you can, in the exam, mention, well, she was positive for factor V Leiden mutation, then this really, I think, leads you into a discussion of factor V much easier than if you had it listed on the case list. And of course, you you could actually um, you know, get into heterozygote versus homozygote. You could possibly introduce that if you wanted to. There's a lot of different ways you can lead the examiner verbally, but I'm talking about on your case list, putting things in a way where you might be able to stimulate the first question that will lead you down the road you wanna go.
I think that a lot of times when you use antibiotics, I think it's preferable to say antibiotics or antibiotic or IV antibiotic if we're talking about an inpatient setting rather than a specific agent. If they only ask you what antibiotic did you use, you can spend 20 seconds, which sounds like nothing, but when you only have one hour, 20 seconds to simply say, I use ANSEF, you know, or whatever the case may be, doxycycline. There's lots of antibiotics that we use. So I prefer to just say antibiotic or antibiotics on my case list. Uh, what if your complication says return to the OR rather than exploratory laparotomy or, uh, you know, whatever the case may be? So return to the OR. Return to the OR for what? Now, it may be that certain cases you have complications that are significant you don't want to make it look like you were avoiding them. So for instance, I would think return to the OR is great when you took a patient back to the OR but you in your evaluation was reassuring. If you take a patient back and find an enterotomy, then you probably need to miss, list the enterotomy and the general surgery console on paper. Return to the OR there might seem like you're being a little bit vague. If, and you won't know till they ask you, but you know again, that might seem like an ambush uh, for them. So this is where you have to be careful. Okay, what if your treatment is diabetes management rather than dietary counseling, monitoring blood sugars, referral diabetic educator, et cetera? It gives you the opportunity for them to say, what do you mean by diabetes management? And then you can verbalize. Well, I always start with dietary counseling, educating a patient on how to check their blood sugars. If they don't have a glucometer, getting them set up with that, monitoring their blood sugars making decisions about whether they need to be on medication, getting them to a diabetic educator, et cetera. So this is, gives you a chance to verbally talk about something that if you listed it all, they're probably gonna skip on to maybe a more difficult question and not take the time to ask you sort of an entry level question that can lead to something you wanna talk about. All right, so at this point, um, I'm gonna stop for one second before we do any structured casework here. I presented a lot of stuff. I went relatively fast because we're really going to focus on a few structured cases tonight, but I want to know if anybody has any questions about caseless construction or caseless preparation, either something I said that they have a question about or something I didn't say that they're wondering about with their caseless. And I want to make clear uh, there are no stupid questions because most of the time other people are worrying about the same thing. And so if there are any questions, if you click the raise a hand feature, I will answer those right now before we move on. Okay, so seeing, oh, let me just see, there might be one here. Hold on one second. Okay, Dr. Hall, did you have a question? Guerrero Hall, are you there? So let's see here. It's telling me that I can't unmute you because you have to enter the pin. Um, so I think I just sent you a pin that you can enter so that you can be unmuted. See if we can do that. Okay, now now I can hear you. Hi, can you hear me? Awesome. Yes. I just had a quick question. So we were talking about arrest of descent or arrest of. I guess my question is, which one sounds better? If there is a preference when writing arrest of descent versus arrest of second stage of labor? I would consider those terms interchangeable, and I don't think either one sounds better or worse, so long as on. If you, on your first case, you say arrest of descent, then on your second case, don't say arrest of the second stage. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And then another question that I have, let's say we were talking about, you know, co-managing patients. And let's say I co-managed a patient for um, a total of eight days for a TOA. And for the first three days, the patient was on an antibiotic. And then the plan was to do an IR drainage, but then my my partner took over. Do you just list the total of days still being eight and then just write co-managed by partner with IR drainage? Yes. Now, was IR drainage all that had to be done um, or did they take, take the patient to the operating room? Just IR drainage. Okay, fine. So anything that was, and truthfully, I would put in the treatment column co-managed with a partner. Um, the IR drainage was going to be done by IR anyway, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Correct. So that's all you have to do. I would put the total number of days the patient was in the hospital, not the number of days that you were the attending. So if she's in there for okay. eight days, put all eight days and just put co-managed with a partner. Now I want to point something out. If your partner had decided, I don't think IR drainage is a good idea and taken her to the OR for a operative laparoscopy excision of an abscess, um, you know, drainage of an abscess, then you would put the 
laparoscopic uh, abscess drainage, or however you wanted to call it, you'd put that in the treatment column and you'd put in parentheses by partner, okay? Mm -hmm. Because they actually so the did IR drainage. The IR drainage is done by IR, so it really doesn't matter. You were going to do the same thing, right? Got it. Yes. But if your partner did I a understand procedure, what you're then you'd want to identify who did the procedure. Make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Yes. Any other questions? All right. I'm going to move on then. Uh, we are going to go to do a couple of structured cases. So what I'm going to look for here is a volunteer, and we'll have a couple of volunteers as we get through the rest of the hour here, a volunteer who's willing to get in the hot seat, and there's no pressure. This is just a beginning of the, of the exam prep uh, season here to kind of go through a couple of structured cases and sort of see how they work. So if somebody will volunteer, if they click the raise a hand feature, I will call on you and we'll get going with a few structured cases. No volunteers. Oh, this is tough. All right, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to show you the first slide, um, and, I'll, and we'll talk a little bit about structure cases, and hopefully somebody will be willing to jump in as, as we get going here. Um, so first thing I want to mention is that in each section of the exam, OB, GYN, and office, we estimate you'll probably have five to seven structured cases during the half hour in OB, five to seven structured cases during the half hour in GYN, five to seven structured cases in the office practice section, okay? Um, the structure cases will usually come at the beginning of the hour because the examiners, they've looked at your case list the night before, but they don't know what the structured cases are until when they show up to give you your exam. A ABOG is very careful about not having any chance the structured cases for a particular test day might be leaked. So the examiners will do the structured cases first. They've been given some information that morning about what they are. Um, and every person who takes the exam that day will have the same structured cases in the morning. And then usually in the afternoon, there'll be some shuffling and the afternoon people will have a separate set of the same structured cases. So if you go to take the exam in the morning with 20 other people, it's gonna be more than that, but I'm just saying all 20 of you are gonna see the same structured cases is what we would expect, okay? So what they're gonna do, I'm gonna move ahead to the first slide. They're gonna often show you a question first. So this is a question that might come up at the beginning of a structured case. What is the chance that a woman in the United States will give birth via cesarean delivery? And a follow-on question, what is the most common indication for primary cesarean delivery? And so the key point in the second part of the question is primary cesarean delivery, obviously. Anybody wanna take a stab at answering these two uh, structured case questions? Okay, it's early in the year, so I can tell I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get much traction with volunteers. Okay, well I'll I'll take you through um, you know how you might handle something like this. First of all, uh, you might not know an exact number, but you might have a uh, an educated guess. So when we think about the likelihood that um, a woman will deliver by cesarean in the United States, it's approximately one in three. OK, so I think you could certainly say, well, you know, I don't know the exact percentage, but I would estimate that it's about a third or one in three. Perfectly fine. Are they going to give you credit for that? If you're in the if you're in the ballpark, if it's the really the right answer, if they're looking for 31.4 percent, they're not going to expect you to know that. OK, now, one of the hard things, though, about the oral exam is that you might give the maybe, you know, the exact percentage for. 2019 or whatever the most recent year is that these numbers were released. Uh, and uh, you could actually give that number in the exam. So you're right on 100% correct and the examiner knows you're 100% correct. They are not gonna look across the table and say, oh, nice job. Good, you know, you really, you're on your stuff. No, they're gonna look across the table and go, are you sure? Where'd you get that number from, you know? And so again, there's a little bit in the exam about you have to be comfortable in your own skin and be confident to answer questions based on your understanding of the material. Um, and don't second guess yourself as you go. When you Once you make a, a decision, commit to it uh, and try not to second guess and flip flop because that really makes things a lot worse. So again, what's the chance? Approximately one third uh, in, in the, around the 30% mark. What is the most common indication for primary cesarean delivery? 
So this information, um, the best place I could tell you to find the answer to this is actually in an ACOG publication. It's in the uh, OB care consensus statement uh, on preventing the first cesarean delivery. So if you go to the ACOG website and you look at clinical documents, you'll see they have this category kind of like practice bulletins, but it's called OB care consensus statements. And uh, they had this one on preventing the first cesarean delivery. You'll find it there. It's a fairly lengthy document, but in it, they'll tell you that the most common indication for primary cesarean delivery is, hopefully all of you have something in your mind, labor arrest, okay? That's about 34% of primary cesarean deliveries. Now, the top three would include non-reassuring fetal heart rate tracing as number two, that's about 23%, and malpresentation, about 17%. I'm using about for these numbers because from year to year, these numbers will change, but consistently, these are the top three. Labor arrest is the one that they rec recognize as the most uh, common. If you compare to a diagnosis like, say I was in the exam and I said maternal request, well, that would not be a good answer for the most common indication for primary cesarean delivery. It'd be very hard for me to imagine that you'd get much credit for that. And if you look at the percentage, it's estimated about 3% of primary cesareans are due to maternal request in the document that I referenced. So this might be the beginning of a, of a structured case. Do I have any volunteers to want to get in the hot seat? I'm going to, I'm going to get, keep giving opportunities. If anybody changes their mind, click the raise a hand button. Uh, the second slide that you would get for the same case might be something like this. You're seeing a patient for her new OB visit. She requests a C-section. How would you handle this request and discuss the risks of a cesarean section versus a vaginal delivery? So, um, you know, the first thing I would say, if they ask you, how would you handle this request? I would probably start the discussion by saying, well, um, when a woman requests a C-section, the first thing I think about is maybe there's a reason. Maybe she actually has an indication. So I, the first thing I would do is I would ask her, this is probably not what you guys might be thinking if you hadn't done any, any preparation for the oral exam. You'd be thinking that they're automatically, you know, talking about an elective C-section. I would start the discussion with maybe there's an indication. Maybe she had uh, been told by a previous doctor that after a full thickness myomectomy, she had to have a C-section. So I would start by getting more information. I would like to know why she's requesting a C-section. And, and if I was in the exam, I would say exactly this. And I would say, I'd be most interested if there might be some medical history she gives me that would be an appropriate indication for a C-section. What's the next question they're going to ask? Well, give me some examples of appropriate indications for a primary C-section, you know, reasons that a patient would need a primary C-section. And then I think I can come up with two or three or four of those, okay? So um, I'm going to be thinking about some other risk factors also potentially when I'm talking to a patient um, about an elective C-section even, uh, her age, her BMI, the accuracy of her gestational dating, her reproductive plans, um, personal values, cultural context come, sometimes come into this. So again, the next step, if there's, if I can't identify a medical reason, is I'd really want to talk to the patient a little bit more about um, what are the, the social or elective reasons that she's requesting a C-section. And, um, you know, really in the absence, I would tell the examiner, in the absence of a maternal or fetal indication, I would recommend to the patient to consider a vaginal delivery and Maybe the reason she's requesting it might be something like a fear of pain, and we could talk about management of pain during labor, and that might be something we could, you know, potentially get her to consider a vaginal delivery. Um, but after exploring, you know, the reasons behind it and her request, I would talk about the risks and benefits. And if the patient desires an elective C-section, then I would um, I would honor that request if I thought she was well counseled and understood, you know, what the pros and cons were. Uh, I wouldn't do it before 39 weeks. I would definitely slip that in there. Okay, so you know, I'm trying to give you guys an example of how I might discuss it in an exam. I would definitely slip in. I would never consider doing it before 39 weeks without a good medical indication, okay? Even though that's kind of common knowledge, it's important to, to make sure and mention that. And so then we talk about, well, what are the risks? The second question here, what are the risks of a cesarean versus a vaginal delivery? I would talk about the fact that uh, the first thing is that an uncomplicated vaginal delivery compared to an uncomplicated cesarean section 
the vaginal delivery will generally have lower blood loss and a quicker and easier recovery for the mother and usually a shorter hospital stay as well. So those would be, in, and notice how I qualified an uncomplicated vaginal delivery versus uncomplicated cesarean delivery, because we really can't predict which way it's gonna go. Um, then I would also talk to the patient about the fact that the rates of things like placenta previa, placenta accreta, and hysterectomy during a future pregnancy are increased with each subsequent cesarean delivery. So I think that's an important thing for the patient to know. And then I would also make sure the patient didn't have any falsely held beliefs about benefits that aren't proven. For instance, I'd wanna make sure that there's not some idea in the patient's mind that if she has an elective cesarean delivery, she won't get prolapse later, okay? Or urinary incontinence later. Because there's not any clear uh, proof that having a C-section is going to guarantee that a patient won't develop these problems um, the effect of the term pregnancy is probably a very significant um, impact on the patient's future, even as much as the, the mode of delivery. Okay, so I think you guys kind of see how this question can be handled. I, let's go, I think I have another slide. Uh, patient, with, it's the same structured case. So one thing I want to point out, in your five to seven structured cases, there will be several slides or several questions that will come out. So here's a pretty specific, so say the patient uh, with a placenta previa, who you're caring for, has a history of three previous cesarean deliveries. What is her risk for placenta accreta? So there are numbers that you can give. This would be tricky because if you don't know the numbers, then you get into the situation where you have to make an educated guess, okay? Um, the, so what I would, what I would, say first, if you don't know, if you're really uncertain, is I would say, well, when a patient has multiple cesarean sections, the more cesarean sections she has, the greater the risk. Okay, I think that's kind of obvious, but I would still state it, okay? Uh, and so then I can tell you this, the risks for uh, accreta with a history of one C-section is about 11%, uh, with a history of two C-sections, approximately 40%, three C-sections, 61%, four C-sections, 67%. And those numbers, um, I, I took those numbers from an ACOG committee opinion number 761. So if you wanna look at that, that's where those came from. So again, I would say that uh, the way I sort of think about this is that one C-section is not as significant of a risk, but as you get beyond the second C-section, the risk really jumps up. And so I would keep that in mind. If you don't know the exact numbers, then you can say, I don't know the exact number, but I know that when you get beyond the second C-section or more, the risk really jumps up. All right, I think this may be the last slide for this case, and it is. So here we're gonna talk about a second case, and I think this will probably be where we end tonight uh, because looking at time, but does anybody wanna jump in the hot seat for this case? All right, I gave you guys a chance. We'll talk about this one in the same way. This is a case that would probably be something that would come up more in the office section of the exam. So the first case was obviously an OB case. This would be a case I might think you'd get in the office section. Now I'm gonna point out, both of the cases that we've looked at started with a question. Not all structured cases will be that way. It used to be that the structured cases would start with a clinical scenario, and then over time there have been some evolution, some changes. So now I know that now there are a lot of times where they'll start with a question and then go to a scenario, but there still can be where they start with the scenario and then go to questions. So at what age does the fecundity of women decrease? And so, uh, you know, I think most of us would, if we didn't have a specific um, reference in mind, we would think about, well, you know, infertility is something we think about affecting women in their late 30s. So I think some of us might say 35 or 37, or maybe somebody might say 40. Um, ACOG has a committee opinion that talks a little bit about this as well. And uh, the, basically the fecundity of women starts to decrease around age 32. It's a very slight decrease at, around age 32 and accelerates after age 37. So if you're talking 35, 37, you're really in the ballpark. If you're talking in the 40s, um, obviously fecundity is much lower in the 40s, but it started a lot earlier than that. So you really, if you're talking in the 40s, you missed the point of the question because they're talking about when does this really start to decrease. 
Uh, so let's go to the next slide. A 42-year-old G0 presents to you to discuss getting pregnant. How would you counsel her about the effects of age on fertility and what would the chance of a live birth be for her with IVF? What if she used eggs from a young healthy donor? So, you know, and I want to mention one other thing. These questions were at the beginning of the case list preparation season. These are very relatively straightforward questions. You will see with our webinars that we will give you some more involved questions. A lot of times longer questions are more difficult because much of the information that's contained may not actually be useful. So it's a matter of sorting out what matters and what doesn't. What's the question they're asking me? These cases are fairly straightforward, but they, they get to some, some key points um, about how you can you know, talk about specific issues. So in this case, how would you counsel a patient about the effects of age on fertility? I think going back to what I said about the first slide, I would tell a patient that uh, as a woman goes through her life, her reproductive years, that in the 30s, fertility is going to decrease starting in the mid 30s and accelerating in the late 30s. Uh, I would, you know, explain that it's a combination of both a diminished number of oocytes, so fewer um, ovulatory events are going to happen, but also a issue of quality of oocytes as well uh, that are going to affect fertility. And if we look at the second question, what would the chance of a live birth be for her with IVF? Uh, if we're talking about a 42-year-old using her own eggs, it would be around 12%, okay? Uh, so, you know, 10 to 12% for a live birth for a 42-year-old using her own eggs. Now, this, um, this is different than what would be the likelihood of a patient being successfully stimulated. There's other ways that you could ask questions about IVF, but just the chance of a live birth, just in general, about 12% for a 41 to 42-year-old. And if the patient uses donor egg, then from a young healthy donor, which is how that works, then her chance of a live birth is 51%. And it actually really doesn't matter what her age is. Um, in general, it's the age of the donor that, uh, that matters. So 51% is a number that would be you could quote for somebody who maybe is 45 or 47. Uh, and these numbers that I'm giving you, the 12% for a 41 to 42 year old and the 51% for donor egg, these are numbers that ACOG cites in some of their publications. The publication that I found these numbers in was ACOG Committee Opinion 589. Now I'll tell you, I have given you a few references as we've talked tonight. I'm not encouraging you to do that in the exam, okay? If you know a reference because you've prepared for the exam, and it's a high yield topic and you have something you know you feel confident about, just present the information. The examiners will likely know uh, references as well. Um, you don't wanna cite some ACOG committee opinion or practice bulletin or some study that was published in a particular journal because that's really not the point. You wanna really just present the information as you understand it and let that stand on its own. And if they ask you for a reference, then of course, if you know one, you can give it but I would not uh, drop uh, references in the exam. That's not gonna be helpful. Okay, let's go. I think there's another slide for this case. Uh, okay, what other factors can affect fertility? So now we're talking about, I would think this is, if I get this question, I like it because I can think of a lot of things I could say. Um, we're talking about besides age. And I would think about uh, things like tubal disease. That's probably the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, this could be related, for instance, to endometriosis. So I'd probably throw that out there. A uh, patient with prior ovarian surgery or a treatment like chemotherapy or radiation therapy that would affect the function of the ovaries. Um, we know that smoking, which is probably more common than the things I just said, but smoking is associated with decreased fertility. So I would definitely mention that. Um, pelvic infection, which goes back to tubal factor infertility. So endometriosis, pelvic infection, I probably should have said that earlier. Uh, in some cases, lyomyomas can be associated with fertility issues, but that's, I think of that as less common. I think of lyomyoma as being more associated potentially with um, early pregnancy loss if we have an intracavitary um, myoma, for instance, um, kind of like a septum. I would think that the, the, now we're talking about pregnancy loss, not about fertility per se. Uh, the other thing I would think about that independent of the patient's age, if there's a strong family history for early menopause and for early decline in fertility, the family history may potentially be relevant as well. Uh, and we could go on, uh, but you guys can see how we can come up with four or five things easily that affect fertility that are not necessarily age specific to this patient. 
Um, so I'm going to stop here for a second. Uh, we're, we're at the end of our webinar for tonight. I want to find out if anybody has any questions. Uh, I would have liked to get you guys in the hot seat, but I'm not the kind of person who's going to beat people up. And I know we're in the very beginning. We're in July. And so I hope, here's what I'm going to say. I hope that any of you that tune into um, webinars later in July, I think the next webinar is going to focus solely on caseless construction issues because we'll be getting close to the submission deadline. But I think the fourth webinar is going to be structure cases. I hope anybody that joins in for that will get in the hot seat because I know you guys are nervous, but I'm telling you, it's free practice. Nobody uh, is going to judge you because we're all in the same place. We're all trying to get ready for this exam. Uh, so um, please do take advantage of the opportunity. So at this point, I'm just going to stop for a second. I want to find out, does anybody have any questions? Have I stimulated any ideas in your mind or things that you're concerned about? If so, I will try to answer them before we wrap up for tonight. All right, so seeing that we, I don't have any questions at this point, I wanna thank all of you for joining in. And I wanna, I wanna just wrap up by mentioning over the next couple of weeks, I would not spend a lot of time on uh, structured cases or mock orals. Spend every minute you have on fine tuning your case list, okay? Uh, and then once you get to the beginning of August and your case list is in, I would shift gears and I, I would cannot encourage you guys enough practice mock orals. If I'm not trying to sell them to you guys. Example, we offer mock orals. It's a great thing. But even if you can get uh, somebody else who's taken the exam, this is, this is the last thing I'll say tonight. If you know another candidate who's taken the exam, maybe somebody you went to, to residency with, I always meet people who are looking for ways to study, and I always tell them this. See if they'll swap a copy of their case list and you give them a copy of yours and even if you're not in the same town, if once a week you can either Zoom or by a phone call or FaceTime, do 20 minutes once a week. And in those 20 minutes, you divide it half and half. The first half, you're going to stump them about one case on their list. So you're going you're gonna to grill them about a case on their list. You're going to have done some homework about that case. You're going to have some good questions. And your goal is to, to you know, put them through their paces. The second half of the 20 minutes, it's the reverse. They're going to do it for you. The reason this is so valuable is that as you are preparing what you want to ask them about a particular case, you're kind of getting some practice about thinking about what does an examiner want to ask. It, and you know, it's not it's not a mystery. They look at the case and they they think, oh, you know, what what, what matters here? What would I ask about? How can I sort of see this person sweat? You know, uh, how can I determine whether they know what they're doing or they just got lucky? Okay. And so I strongly recommend this. It, it's, it's not the only studying you should do, but if you can find somebody and you can quiz each other, uh, then I think this can be very beneficial. So hopefully you guys can consider that as one possibility. If you're taking the exam in October, it is gonna be here before you know it. I just cannot tell you how fast time will go by. Um, but even if you have the exam in December, it's gonna, it's gonna come pretty quick. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I wanna thank all of you for joining me tonight. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this webinar. And the next webinar will be scheduled for this Sunday. I'm pretty sure because, uh, you, you know, I, I'm really sorry about last night and the fact that it got delayed. But we're usually pretty good about being right on schedule. So I'm pretty sure for this coming Sunday, you'll be right on schedule. Uh, and uh, please do join us and we'll see you then. Thank you very much. Have a great night.